It's day two of Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow. He met Putin informally yesterday, and today the two leaders met again. But the meeting was overshadowed by this. What you saw was an explosion in Crimea. Russian cruise missiles were destroyed, and Russia's Black Sea fleet has been hit. That's because the cruise missiles were designed to be launched from those ships. Russia says it was a drone attack. Ukraine's defense ministry has confirmed the explosion, but it has not taken responsibility for the attack. If a Ukrainian hand is proven, it will be an escalation, a daring attack deep inside what is now Russian territory. And remember the timing of the strike. The Chinese president is in Russia. He has come with a peace plan. Xi Jinping presented the plan to Putin yesterday, and Putin said, we are ready to talk. We have carefully studied your proposals on setting the acute crisis in Ukraine. You are also well aware that we are always open for negotiation process. We will discuss all these issues, including your initiatives. We are always open for negotiation, says the Russian president. But that was yesterday. Will his tone change today after the Crimea explosion? Putin met Xi Jinping for formal talks and, as always, he spoke in riddles. It's obvious that President Putin and President Xi discussed Beijing's 12-point peace plan for Ukraine because they said they would discuss it. If you remember, Putin said so last night. I will not be giving any assessments. Let us wait for the statements from the media. Which brings us to Xi Jinping. What is his peace plan? And what does China want? For starters, Beijing is pushing for a ceasefire, followed by peace talks between both sides. Of course, that's something that China hopes to oversee. They've not said it on record so far, but if you go through the statements in the Chinese press, you get the picture. China has been talking about an end to hostilities and a ceasefire in Ukraine. But it's easier said than done. There are clear stumbling blocks for China here. First of all, Ukraine may not agree, because a ceasefire would mean loss of territory for them. It would be advantage Russia. And the West most likely will not be on board. The U.S. is already talking about it. It says a ceasefire will go in Putin's favor and leave Russian forces inside Ukraine. But we are concerned that instead, China will reiterate calls for a ceasefire that leaves Russian forces inside Ukraine's sovereign territory. Now, any ceasefire that does not address the removal of Russian forces from Ukraine would effectively ratify Russia's illegal conquests. The U.S. thinks a ceasefire will help Putin buy time, that it will help Russian forces regroup and possibly launch a bigger offensive later. But all this is on expected lines. What's interesting, though, is the Ukrainian response. Zelensky has been keen to talk to the Chinese president. The two leaders have not spoken since the war began, not even once. And reports say Xi Jinping may call up Zelensky soon. It could be a virtual meeting. The dates have not been announced formally, but there's a lot of buzz. The call may happen after she leaves Moscow. The question is, why is Zelensky keen to engage with Xi Jinping? And the answer is, why not? He has some compelling reasons, like Chinese money. It's a trap in the long run. But for a country battered by war, Chinese investment can help in rebuilding. Also, pushing China away comes with its own risks. Beijing could double down on its support to Russia. It could share more military aid, even lethal arms. So Zelensky might want to get a foot in that door. At least make himself heard. And it's not like he's very firm on principles. He's happy to do business with anyone who gives him money and arms. He's working with the Pakistanis, for God's sake. We'll talk about it. So China would be welcome. The Ukrainian president has not criticized the Chinese proposals. He has dropped hints that he would like to discuss them. But can Zelensky influence China's outcomes? More importantly, how much importance would China give to Zelensky, especially when Vladimir Putin is on the other side? Tomorrow is Xi Jinping's last day in Moscow. Will he be able to change the course of this war? Can the dragon play peacemaker? As much as the world wants peace, I'm sure many are betting on him to fail.
And now let's talk about the Ukraine-Pakistan nexus. Western powers played the matchmakers and this is how it turned out. Pakistan is the latest country to pledge tanks to Ukraine. Reports say Pakistan will send 44 tanks. These are the T-80UD tanks. Earlier, Pakistan reportedly sent 10,000 rockets to Kiev. Does this mean that Pakistan has suddenly sprouted some conscience? That the nation which has waged three territorial wars against India suddenly feels that military land grabs are wrong? Rest assured, that's not the case. This is Pakistan trying to appease the West, specifically trying to keep the U.S. happy to pave the way for bailout funds. Remember, Pakistan is going through a crippling economic crisis. It desperately needs funds from the IMF, but that money has not come in yet. So Pakistan is trying to portray itself as a Western ally. It helps that Islamabad has a long history of military cooperation with Kiev. Since the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, Ukraine and Pakistan have been in business. Between 1991 and 2020, they've had defense contracts worth $1.6 billion. Pakistan has bought about 320 tanks from Ukraine. Again, these are the T-80UD tanks. They're upgraded versions of the Soviet-era T-80 tanks. And what Pakistan is doing now is just returning some of them. So it's sending tanks, it has already sent rockets, and it's also facilitating Ukraine's Western allies, the UK, for instance. Reports say the UK used Pakistani air bases to send military equipment to Ukraine. We told you about this last month. Pakistan's ports, too, are being used to ship containers carrying arms. They arrive in Germany and Poland, and from there, they are sent to the front lines in Ukraine. So Pakistan provides both air and sea routes for arms and also military equipment. It makes Pakistan sound like an invaluable ally to the West. Perhaps even an ally the West cannot allow to fail. Which then brings us to the question, why is Pakistan cozying up to the West again? Does Islamabad not have China's backing? Well, it does, but probably not as much as it would like. China has been hesitant about pumping more money into Pakistan. It has halted some infrastructure projects. These were part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China has been frustrated by the delays, not to mention the attacks on Chinese assets. And it's not just China. Pakistan's Gulf allies are also tired. Their promises of aid have become sporadic, and it makes sense. How much good money will be thrown after bad? especially when it doesn't benefit the Pakistani people. The lion's share of this money is taken up by the military. So now Pakistan is finally back to appeasing the West, and this time it's using its military stockpiles to appeal for aid. And for once we say, it could be a decent move. Pakistan could do with pruning its armed forces. And for once, its defense supplies could actually end up being used for defense. But if Pakistan's moves do result in a bailout, the West will prove that it never learns. Do you remember the war on terror? The US invading Afghanistan to find Osama bin Laden. Years spent conducting a manhunt, only for him to be found in Pakistan. America's invaluable strategic partner in the war on terror, harboring America's most wanted terrorist. And bin Laden was not the only one. Pakistan provided a safe haven to the Taliban, the Haqqanis who killed American soldiers. Pakistan kept playing a double game. Between 2002 and 2015, the West gave it $31 billion in aid. $31 billion to fight their war on terror. And what did they get in return? Body bags and a Taliban regime in Kabul. Now they're partnering with the very same Pakistan to fight the war in Ukraine. You know what they say? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Well, fill in the blanks. It's that time of the year again. The US has released its annual human rights report. Human rights in other countries, of course. The report is out, and nothing in it stands out, except for the breathtaking hypocrisy of America. It talks about Russian war crimes in Ukraine. It talks about Iran's crackdown on anti-hijab protesters, China and its treatment of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, the horrors of the Myanmar military. It covers pretty much every country in the world, including India, and it shows how America is stuck in a time warp. It still sees itself as a sole superpower, and it's still tone deaf. The section about India is almost the same as the last year. Paragraphs have been lifted almost verbatim from the 2021 report. 
The only new criticism seems to be the bulldozing of homes. The rest remains the same. And just like last year, most nations are likely to refute this report, which begs the question, why make it at all? And this is not some random American report we're talking about. This one comes from the U.S. State Department. It has the government stamp of approval. It is a report on all countries receiving American assistance and all United Nations member states. These reports are submitted to the U.S. Congress, and this is legally mandated by the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 and the Trade Act of 1974. You could say the American law mandates that they sit in judgment of the world. Now, how accurate are these reports? It depends on who you ask. Look at the case of Saudi Arabia, a long-standing ally of the U.S., but not towing Washington's line off late. How does America get Riyadh back in line? Just bring up their human rights record. And for a country that has appointed itself the class monitor on human rights, how does America's own record look? You won't find the answers in this report because the U.S. chose not to include itself. Now, ideally, India or any of these other countries should be releasing a report on human rights in the U.S. But they don't. They don't go beyond the odd word of condemnation. So we decided to do the honors. Here's a report on human rights in the U.S. We'll start with the most recent controversy. The Biden administration wanted to share details of Russian war crimes with the International Criminal Court. Guess who blocked it? The Pentagon. The reason? The Pentagon was afraid that it would set a precedent, a precedent for American war crimes to be probed in the same court. And I'm not making this up. The Pentagon is so afraid of what war crime trials will lead to that it won't allow the ICC to prosecute Russia, its own enemy. It makes me wonder just how horrific the U.S. military's actions have been over the years. And speaking of the U.S. military, the world is again talking about the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. It's been 20 years. The two nations have been devastated. And now this video has gone viral. It's from 2020. It shows a U.S. war veteran confronting Joe Biden. Just listen to him. You sent us to harm civilians, he says. The story gets worse when you focus on human rights. A certain Guantanamo Bay episode comes to mind. It's the infamous offshore torture chamber operated by the U.S. and Cuba. They call it Gitmo. The images of abuse shocked the world. America promised to shut it down, but it hasn't. And why do they have it in Cuba? Because such torture is not allowed on American soil, so they do it anyway in Cuba, and they don't mention it in the human rights report featuring Cuba either. We wonder why. Also speaking of torture, we are reminded of Abu Ghraib. It was a prison in Iraq where locals were tortured. The images sent shockwaves through the world, a blinding testimony of how America honors human rights. Did the perpetrators face justice? How many high-ranking officials were allowed to go scot-free? How about an annual report on this? And I can go on. There's ingrained racism and police brutality, the gun terror. It's the only country in the world where you're more likely to be killed by a teenager than a terrorist. Children are shot dead in schools in America. There are dystopian gender controls like the abortion law. How is all of this not an affront to human life and dignity? And look, the U.S. is free to make its annual human rights report. But these reports are not made with the aim of fixing any of this. America is weaponizing human rights, and it's appalling. It reeks of U.S. hypocrisy.